This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Linode, high-performance cloud hosting for everyone. Visit linode.com slash macvoices and take $20 off your first server package. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. This is the second in our two-part discussion with Kirk McElhern in a conversation that was supposed to have just two or three subjects and ended up having a whole lot more. In the first part, we talked about Apple Music, uh, cooking, um, calculators, and, and a whole lot more. But we also started a conversation about the challenges and benefits of backing up to a network-attached storage drive or NAS drive. And that's where we picked the conversation up again. So, back with Kirk. And, and and heaven knows, man, the one place you don't want to have errors thrown up is your your backup software because exactly. that's you know that's a little terrifying. Yeah. I, and I I wanted to talk about it. You wrote that article, and I wanted to talk about it because we have talked with Synology on the show, um, and I I more and more people I think are buying NASes of some kind. Now Synology's one, Drobo is another. Um, that I think Western Digital has, you know, their flavors. Certainly, I have Western Digital on my cloud, and I had a Synology, I had a Drobo. Um, so yeah, they are becoming more and more common. Yeah, and other world computing has a, a number, uh, you know, of of they tend to, to skew toward the more professional, higher end. But you know, they, yeah. you, depending, you can still buy them. No reason you can't. And yeah. the idea of the disk redundancy, I think, is the thing that is people are slowly be coming to understand this. That if I'm backing up to one drive, you know, and one disk, then that disk is just as susceptible as anything else. But if I'm backing up to a NAS, okay, now I've got that redundancy that if one drive fails, I might have one, two, three, four, or more others that will pick up the slack and give me a chance to recover from that failure. Well, it's not even quite like that. So I got a, a two drive unit and, and I'm not using redundancy. I'm using them as two separate drives. Um, but when you're using a RAID system, it's a lot more complicated that let's say you've got five drives, it creates a RAID array, and all the data goes on the one array. If I'm not mistaken, five drives with RAID five, you get 40% of the total. So let's say if you've got five, four terabyte drives, you'd get what? 40% of 20 is eight. You'd get eight terabytes of usable. So what happens is like it's writing it multiple times. So if a drive fails, it's written in multiple places and you can just replace the drive. It rewrites everything to replace it. You can even have two drives fail and still be safe. Um, so it's not technically it's not redundancy where it's the same thing on both drives. So that that is another way to do it. That is one way of doing RAID. Um, for me, it's two separate drives, one for my Plex library, one for backups, because I've got backups here in my office. I've got online backups with Backblaze. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very redundant, and I have uh, even an extra backup for my music because, I mean, God forbid I lose my music library, right? Well, all the time I've spent ripping CDs and adjusting tags, you know, that's just invaluable. Yeah, yeah. So I'm less interested in the redundancy on the NAS than I am in it being one of multiple backup targets in case something happens. And of course, one of them offsite being Backblaze. Right. So you mentioned Carbon Copy Cloner. So you're not using uh, this as a time machine backup option. No, I'm not. And the problem with time machine backups on a network is time machine creates a disk image when it's on a network. And if you've ever used time machine for network backups, every few months you're going to get a message saying that your disk image has been corrupted and it has to start over. So there's no way to have a reliable time machine backup on a network. Um, I have a time machine drive. I'm up to drive four. So initially I had Time Machine, then Time Machine 2, Time Machine 3, Time Machine 4. And like the old ones, after a while I take them off. And I've got files going back to 2017 on an eight terabyte Time Machine drive. Um, I'm about to get a new drive because my Time Machine drives are more than three years old. And, and for me, when a drive's three years old, I start getting the heebie-jeebies. Um, but I keep them because you can always connect them, option click on the Time Machine menu extra, browse other disks or something like that, and then you can go back to other drives. Um, but Time Machine on a network is a mistake. You shouldn't use it. Um, something like Carbon Copy Cloner, they have their um, – they have a folder where when they when something's erased, they move it into another folder. We, what's it called? 
Um, not good radio when you have this. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. Um, well, I, I can't see right now because I don't have a drive mounted with it, but they, they have a folder where you can optionally keep the older files until you run out of space. Um, so if you do lose something, you can still search for it on the drive. Um, if you've accidentally deleted something and deleted it in your backup, you'll have it in the previous folders. If there's enough space, if not, a, that, right. if not too and, much time and, has gone by. Yeah, and you should never um, try to back up more than half um, a, a drive. In other words, if you've got four terabytes of data to back up, you should use an eight terabyte drive. You, you need to assume that uh, with software like this, it's going to overwrite uh, files that are changed and add new files. It's going to be increasing all the time. You don't want to run out of space. You, you And it's the same with Time Machine. Um, you want to have twice as much storage as what you have now. Uh, and, and my rule of thumb is keep a hard drive for three years, then replace it and destroy it. Because hard drives fail. Um, maybe SSDs won't fail. We really don't have enough long-term use of, of current SSDs yet. Um, you know, no moving parts, so they're likely to last longer, but there's something about sectors being overwritten too many times, and, and I don't know how that plays out. Uh, the, but the SSDs, of course, are too expensive for backups, and they don't even make sense because SSDs are for files you're going to access now. Uh, backups, well, you don't need fast access to them. So they, in backup, they call that cold storage when you put something on a, on a hard drive as opposed to flash. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's a point that people miss too, because um, we all, you know, you, you, they sell they sell the hard drives on the speed thing. And it's like, you know, okay, if you're just looking for raw storage, now if you're, if, if you're going to access, like you said, a Plex library or something like that, yeah, now we need to talk about performance. But if you're just going to do it for storage, man, buy, buy cheap, slow drives. Well, you know, no, don't buy cheap. But well, don't buy fast. Yeah, the okay. Four hundred RPM drives are fine. Don't buy cheap drives. Well, because, but, but by the by the nature of being fifty four hundred RPM, they're cheaper than the fast drives. Right. So right, yeah. And you don't need to buy. I mean, I think there's ten thousand RPM drives now. You don't need to buy if it's just for the occasional backup. You don't need the kind that's rated for use on a NAS because. So when they talk about using drives on a NAS, it's because the NAS is on all the time, but. You and I, we're not hitting the NAS all the time. We're, we're hitting it when we do backups or when I'm streaming a film. So it's not like it's being used. Um, the, the, you'd worry about that if you're in a business, if you're at a data center, then you need the, the performance uh, of a drive that's going to last for a long time. Um, Backblaze, I think every year they publish um, the results of their drives and how many have failed of each type, and they have lots of different types. And from year to year, you can see how the capacities increase that, you know, they've gotten rid of all the two terabyte drives and replaced on the high end to eight. And um, so it's a good way of seeing, but those are drives that are spinning all the time. Yeah. And here we go. But for NAS, you want to make sure you're buying a, a drive that is rated for a NAS because, as you said, it's going to be on pretty much all the time. Yeah, well, but no, because if you're not using it a lot, then it really doesn't matter that much. It doesn't matter that it's on so much. If 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 you're going to have it, if you're going to turn it off, yes, I would agree with you. No, not even if if it's just sitting there idling, it's not doing anything. I mean, it may be spinning, but it's not reading or writing. So I don't think that's a big worry. I think the worry is that if you're act actively using it all the time, you've got the heads moving back and forth, and that's what can cause problems more than just the spinning. I may be wrong, but but it seems to me that, you know, uh, again, a data center is going to have drives that are being used 24-7, whereas for us, you know, I've got, I've got a couple of backups that run overnight. Um, I stream a movie a couple times a week, and that's about it. Hmm. That is a good question because I've always understood that, like uh, Western Digital, the Reds, you know, are what you want to buy for the NAS because I thought it was the spinning part. I mean, if it's the head, it's the head movement part. You're absolutely right. If it's the spinning part, then you want to probably go with something that's rated to spin I'll, most of the time. Well, I I think again, maybe someone can correct me, but I think a lot of that is marketing. Um, there's a very big difference between what you're doing in your home compared to what you're doing in a business, right? A business running a NAS, they're going to have people accessing it all the time. Um, you know, they sold us on diamonds are a girl's best friend, right? Uh, in the early 20th century, they can marketing people can do a lot. 
Uh, fair point. Fair point. I can't, so, can't argue with that. One thing I did find out, and I'm not going to go into it because I haven't entirely understand it, is you want to avoid SMR drives. You can look this up afterwards. Okay. It's some new technology that's problematic with NASA's. And there was actually a bit of a kerfuffle when one company was saying their drives were optimized for NASA's, but they were really SMR drives. And they've had to come out and say which ones are and which ones aren't. Um, again, see, I want to buy a thing. I want to plug it in. I want to make it work. I don't want to have to worry about, do I have to get this specific drive, model number X47295B, because it's not the SMR. And it's like, no. I, and, I, I, and so what I did is I bought the, the NAS and the drive separately um, because it was a little bit cheap. I mean, these things are expensive. I don't know if you've noticed, but hard drives have gone up in price recently. Um, so this is 600 pounds for the two four terabyte drives and the NAS. That's about $800. Um, that's not cheap. That's the price of a Mac mini. Um, so I saved like 50 pounds, 75 pounds buying the drive separately, putting them in myself. Because I'll tell you, that's easy, putting a, a hard drive into a Synology NAS. I mean, that's brain dead simple. Um, but it, it's not a cheap device. And I, I think it's really useful for anyone who does need um, – two, two things for me that stand out is um, the, the Plex and the backup. But another one is if you need to access your files remotely, um, they've got an app that you can connect to remotely and get files. And these files are on your computer. They're not in someone's cloud uh, I, I like to tell people, you know, the cloud, that's just someone else's computer hosting your file. Now, you may trust Dropbox and Apple that your files are encrypted, but it's still on someone else's computer. So you can keep your files on your NAS, access them remotely relatively easily. Of course, the problem is if your power goes out or your internet drops, then you're stuck. Right. And one other thing before we leave the NAS subject that, that I think you're a great guy to talk about. Uh, is is that you not only have a huge music collection that you're constantly adding to, but you're a photographer, and so you your storage needs are probably double or triple or quintuple what you know an average person is because most people don't have the library the photo library you have, and are not generating excuse me the the music library you have, and are not generating the kind of photo content that you are as well unless they're a professional. Well, I actually don't have a very big photo library. I think my photos library is 70 or 80 gigabytes. Um, people who have lots of photos are people who have young children. Um, like what, what I do, and I just happen to have my camera here. It's on my desk because I was taking some pictures before and moving them to my computer. And so I went outside. I shot a bunch of photos for my podcast, Photoactive. That's photoactive.co. We couldn't afford the M. Um, because Jeff Cross and I, we have a challenge um, this month to take one photo per day. If this is a thing photographers like to do, this sort of challenge. So we're each taking a photo a day, and we're making shared albums. We're going to discuss it in September. Um, what I do is I import my photos. I don't import my photos into my photos library. I import them into another folder. I look at them. I pick the ones that I want to keep or edit, and then I put those in my photos library. So I went out before this podcast, I shot about 20, 30 photos in the neighborhood, and I kept one of them. So I don't litter my photos library with photos that I don't like. And I know a lot of people do that. They just dump everything in there, and then they decide later what they're going to do with it. I don't do that because I don't want a huge photos library. Okay. But people who have young children, um, someone on Twitter was saying that, he hit the 20,000 photo limit in Google Photos in less than a year because oh he's got young kids. And if you're, you know, young kids taking photos all the time, it's understandable. Um, and when my son was young, I had a film camera, a little, you know, point and shoot film camera. I got a digital camera in, I believe it was 2003 or four. So he was already 14, and he didn't want his picture taken very often anyway. Um, and the photos back then were tiny compared to now. Um, so, you know, I've got like hundreds of photos uh, scanned from film photos and, and old digital photos, but not a lot. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Linode. You can build it on Linode. 
Linode has opened their newest data center in Mumbai, India. That one, along with others around the world, gives Linode the ability to put your server anywhere you want it to accommodate any local regulatory needs that you might face. And that's just one more addition to all the great features you get with Linode. A dedicated CPU, distributed applications, native SSD storage, a 40 gigabit network, industry-leading processors, the ability to deploy many different servers in literally minutes with their one-click installs, and a new cloud manager. If you've built servers with other providers, then you know how important those things are. And if you haven't, well, there's no need for you to go through the pain some of us already have. Sign up with Linode at linode.com slash macvoices and get $20 off your first order. That's Linode, L-I-N-O-D-E dot com slash macvoices for $20 off your first server package. Go now and your server will be up and running before you know it. One more time, linode.com slash macvoices to save $20 on your first order. Thanks to Linode for their support of Mac Voices. Okay, so your needs are not quite what some folks are. No. I, they said I do have a lot of cat photos. I don't want to even – I'm not even going to ask. I'm just going to let that go. Well, I um, got two cats, and I like taking can, pictures of the cats. In there, okay, you know. yeah, you're one of those. Yeah, I just, okay. cat, cat photos. Cat photos make the internet function. They Kirk, they do, and I'll be darned. I don't. I can't understand what the appeal is of cats. I, I'm I'm not an animal person, so let's say that right there. But you know, there's something about cats and and you cat lovers that the dog lovers don't seem to share quite as much. I don't know why. I don't know if dogs are too active or what. But you you don't see a, a dog dogs photo are memes. A lot more active, but you do get more videos of dogs playing than you do of cats. Um, but cats are cute. Especially little kittens, they're cute. I mean, puppies are cute too, but cats are cuter, I think. No, don't want to start an animal yeah, war. I mean, yeah, I'm just baby gonna parrots gonna... are cute as well and <laughs> you know, all those sorts of things. But cats are cute. People like cats. And there was an article last week about how um, looking at these animal videos and, and photos and all actually reduce stress. Because let's say you're looking through Twitter and you've got all these like politics and 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 people yelling and screaming and, and it was a little kitten photo, a little kitten video or something. It's like ah, it's like a deep <laughs> breath. Um, so it does reduce stress. Please, folks, send your cat videos and photos to Kirk. He he, he will love them. He wants to be calm. <laughs> I I have tons. Of, you know, I've I've set up Instagram. Um, so basically, you know, the search tab on Instagram, basically it's all cat photos. Cause I've just said that everything else I don't want, be I don't want to see what Instagram wants me to see basically. So like they try to show you all sorts of things and you, you tap and hold, but not interested. Um, and I've gotten rid of just about everything, but lots of cat photos, lots of kitten photos. Hey, we're right back to it. Each to their own, whatever, yep. whatever makes you happy, whatever makes yep. you happy. Hey, I wanted to circle back before we wrap up to, to the Apple Music question, or Apple Music's topic. Which Google and Amazon have come out, you know, they're trying to do more things. Of course, Spotify is is trying to beat up on Apple for different reasons, but, you know, they're, they're a comp competitor. So I, I put to you, what what's next for Apple Music and what's next for all these music services other than just A, more music or B, um, lower prices? Because at some point, there's you know, I I want to listen to a track. There's only so much I can do with yeah, that. Yeah, there's, there's not much differentiation, and that's why Spotify is going into podcasts. Um, they've got a number of podcasts that um, they're not entirely exclusive. I don't know who this Joe Rogan guy is. I think he's kind of like um, who was the guy on New York radio back in the 80s and 90s who's still around on Sirius XM. Uh, um, Howard Stern. Howard Stern. I think right. it's a thing like that. They've also got Michelle Obama. Um, as far as I'm concerned, a podcast that is not available on every app, podcast app is not a podcast. It's an audio program. It's like radio. Um, they're going into podcasting because they think there's money in podcasting. And if you've got a, a fan base of a million people or more, yes, there's money in advertising for that. But I think the, the, the podcasting pyramid um, doesn't have that many podcasters that high up. Amazon's just been sending out emails to people to get them to register podcasts with Amazon. Um, I don't know if they sent them to everyone, but I got like four of them. Um, I guess they got my 
address from my um, RSS feed because in the RSS feed you have to have an email address. Um, I, I don't think – I mean Apple has always had – Apple was the first to do podcast, and then they kind of segregated it into a different app. And so that actually is going to complicate things a bit if Spotify is going to try and put podcasts together with music, right? So Apple's going one way and podcast um, Spotify's going the other way. I don't think people generally listen to podcasts, then music, then podcasts and music in like in a playlist, but they might if they have specific podcasts they subscribe to, they might want to see that in their music app rather than going into another app. And of course, Apple, you know, removed that. So we don't have that kind of cross synergy. Um, but they, I think they've all got about 60 million tracks. Um, you, 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 I, I don't know that there's any exclusives anymore. For a while, there were exclusives here and there, but I don't think that happens anymore. It's not in anyone's interest. It's not in the artist's interest um, to do exclusives. It's not in the platforms. No one's going to um, switch from one platform to another just to get a Taylor Swift album a week earlier. They'll go listen to it on YouTube where someone's uploaded it um, rather than make that kind of a switch. So I think what we're going to see, there's been a lot of talk recently um, about a potential Apple subscription bundle, which would include Apple Music, Apple TV Plus, and perhaps other services. I think that's Apple's direction that they can leverage the other services they have where Spotify has nothing else. Is is a subscription bundle worthwhile? That I mean, that's a discussion for another show because it is kind of complex. If it's just like, well, if you get Apple Music, it's ten dollars, and if you want Apple Music Plus TV, it's thirteen dollars, and if you want Apple Arcade, it's fifty. It's like it's not a bundle. It's it's just one thing plus add-on. So th there has to be a really compelling price to get anyone to subscribe to everything because most people don't want Apple News Plus. A lot of people don't want Apple Arcade. Some people don't want Apple TV Plus. Um, I, I think Apple's synergy with services is going to help them in the long run. But they're always going to compete with, uh, you know, Spotify and Amazon and others in part. So Apple does have a Apple Music app for Android. They have a TV app for Android, I believe. Um, they don't have a news app for Android. They don't have an arcade app for Android. So even if they offer a bundle to non-Apple users, they're not going to get the Android users for all of these services. Apple can certainly survive just catering to people who buy Apple hardware. The question is, will they try to extend further? And, you know, your guess is as good as mine there. Yeah, I the, the bundle thing is interesting. Um, I and, and I'm kind of reserving all judgment or comments until we see exactly what they're going to do. Because some of the services like iCloud uh, are computer services. Some are entertainment services. Some cross the line between entertainment and computer. And so... Yeah, but they all know. work with your devices. Oh, um, absolutely, yeah. The, call, calling, uh, if you think about iCloud, for most people, it's for backups and photos. Um, let me just underscore my frustration that Apple's still only giving five gigabytes of iCloud storage um, per account, no matter how many devices you have, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, but I think I think the Apple thing is more – so here's what I would like to see. And back in 2015, I wrote an article about this. I would like to see Apple become a mobile virtual network operator. I pay a monthly fee. I get my iPhone. I get my Apple Care. I get my minutes. I get my data. I get my iCloud, Apple Music, t the whole thing. I don't know. Give me 60 bucks a month for, for – I got an iPhone 11. It costs 41 pounds a month on the Apple upgrade program. Um, my phone contract is 12 pounds XVAT, so 15 pounds. So 55 for pretty much an unlimited phone contract. S give me 75 pounds to cover all that, the phone, the mobile service, and all the other services, and I'm in. One bill, one provider, and the advantage they would have if they became a mobile virtual network operator is obviously they'd have to make deals in every country, but you would be able to access multiple networks instead of being locked into a single network as you are now. 
So they'd be buying minutes from multiple networks, right? Got it. I see so what here doing. we've got three or four networks, and sometimes the network I'm on is the best, but in other places another one's the best, but I can't go to the other one. Um, if they were buying minutes from all different networks, there is a setting in the iPhone to automatically get the best network. Um, generally something you only see when you're on roaming. Whereas the, the your, your phone company will have a roaming deal in other countries with multiple networks for coverage. Um, Apple can do the same thing. They've got market clout. They've got you know enough users that they could negotiate really low rates and throw the whole thing in a single package. That would be interesting. I grant you. I grant you. That's hmm. Okay, Apple, get on that. <laughs> I, you know, you you mentioned the exclusive podcast. I, I've I've listened to a couple that they made that they said right up front. You know, you can go to Spotify and binge the whole series because they were maybe a 10, 12, 14 episode series, and you or you can just wait and we'll release them. You know, one a week. And it's like, first of all, I've, I'm not a, I'm not a big binge person. Um, I'd rather bounce around. And so as a result, I've just listened to those as they've come out and it's been fine. And then, and even, even the ones that are really compelling, you know, you get to that, that third or fourth episode. It's like, well, I really want to see what happens or I want to see what the next part of the story is. I can wait till next week. You know, no matter how much, how much, okay, I, how badly I want to. There's two types of podcast listeners, Chuck. You know very well. There's the ones like you and me who have a whole list of podcasts, and we listen to them. Or we don't. We don't listen to every episode, but we've always got a rolling list of podcasts, and it's never going to run out. And then there's the people who listen to one or two podcasts because they found someone who's interesting, and when one's over, they want another. Um, I think it's a very different audience. I hadn't thought about it that way. I guess I was looking at it from the standpoint of, is there any content that is so compelling that is only on Spotify that, or it, it's available first on Spotify that I want to go there and, and break my, uh, my podcast uh, app of choices overcast. So now I've got to go and figure out a way to, how am I, how do I listen to it on Spotify? You need the Spotify use, app. Uh, you, right. You need the Spotify app. So now I'm going to switch out of my Overcast app and go to Spotify. No. If I can just wait and let it dribble into my Overcast app the way that everything else dribbles in, I'm a happy I'm a happy camper. Yeah, but so, you would have passed the marshmallow test, Chuck. Do you know the marshmallow test? Oh, I'm, is it, as long as it's not obscene, go for it. No, no. It's a, a psychology thing. I think the kids were four or five years old, and they put kids in a room, and they gave them a marshmallow. And they said, if you can wait 10 minutes, I'll give you a second marshmallow. And some of the kids couldn't wait and ate the first marshmallow, and some of them did wait and got two marshmallows. And I think the long-term study shows that the people who, who passed the marshmallow test, who waited, were more successful in life, were happier, less stress, et cetera. Don't quote me on the, on the actual long-term results, but I know that there was something actually quite significant. So you're happy with your marshmallow. You'll get another one next week. Um, there's some people who want the marshmallow right away. You can Google look. the marshmallow test. If you didn't know this before, you're going to find something interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost afraid of what it's going to tell me about myself. No, no, no. It's <laughs> no. There's people who can and people who can, and you yeah. know, it's like you're watching Netflix, and if it's a really good series, you want to watch another episode. Podcasting for me is different. There's not that, okay, this has gotten to a sort of ending, but what's going to happen next? That's not the case with podcasts. Um, I, I don't see it being the same kind of thing. But again, if people aren't podcast listeners, and that's what Spotify is hoping, it, they're getting people who don't really listen to podcasts. If they're going to become podcast listeners, then they don't have a lot to choose from. And they're going to just want to keep listening to what's available, uh, you know, the marquee stuff that Spotify is presenting them. Hmm. Okay, so I, 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 I think I, podcasts are threatening for a lot of people. You've got to use a different app. You've got to subscribe. What happens if I subscribe? They're going to charge me money. Oh no, is it safe? Right? And and there are a lot of issues. Even though you know we've been doing this for what fifteen years, um, there are people who don't know how it works and. Who might be worried about that? No, that's true. That's true. But what you were saying, though, about the difference between podcasts and Netflix, do you find that with an audiobook? I mean, do you find that you you hit a chapter in an audiobook and you can't wait to get to the next one? Or sometimes, yeah, but it depends on the audiobook, and it depends because for me, audiobook listening is like really, I've got a time to listen. I I don't commute, so it's like. 
the weather's really nice. I'm going to sit out in the garden with an audio book and a bottle of cider, right? And I'm not going to sit there for three hours. So I don't necessarily have that that flexible time to listen to audiobooks the same way. Um, and I wouldn't listen to podcasts like that. I listen to podcasts when I go walking, um, you know, half hour, 45 minutes. When I come back, maybe I'm going to listen to the end of a podcast if it hasn't finished because it's really interesting. Maybe not. But it's not something for me that's going to keep continuing because I just have to listen. Um, whereas Netflix, you're already in the position to watch TV. And you're in a series that has an arc and something's happening and the next thing's happening. And, you know, series are designed like that. Even if there's not a, a an actual cliffhanger at the end, you know, it's designed to make you want the next episode. Yeah. But then you start falling asleep at two in the morning and you just can't watch anymore. So at some point you have to give up. Yeah, good point. Kirk, this might been, have been the, the most widely ranging discussion, I think, that I, definitely that you and I have ever had and maybe that has ever been on the show. I mean, we went from hard cider to the marshmallow test and beyond. So thank we you. We didn't even <laughs> talk about first flush Darjeeling tea. We, <laughs> on One the of next these days, edition, I'll tell you about my tea fanaticism. <laughs> on the next edition of Mac Voices, Kirk drinks tea. <laughs> oh, this is not just tea, Chuck. This is, this is the champagne of tea. Oh, oh okay. All right. But this will have to be another episode. All right. That sounds good. <laughs> hey, um, before you go, tell everyone where they can find you for all your projects, because I know you mentioned some of them along the way, but give them a yep. good bookend. Go to Kirkville.com and you'll have everything. I post links to all my podcasts. In fact, lately I post the actual podcast on my website embedded so you can stay on my website and click the little buttons and listen and scroll down the page and listen to another one and another one. Um, so Kirkville.com. Perfect. Perfect. Kirk, thanks. This has been a lot of fun. I really, really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you for having me again, Chuck. We'll see you soon. Yep. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. You may want to go back and listen to this one a couple times because I think there's a lot of meat to this one that, uh, that we covered just because of all the subjects. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com Bandwidth provided by CashFly at CashFly.com.